So I want to talk this morning uh, about a friend of mine named Dave Humphrey, who teaches here at Seneca. And I also want to talk about a movement that Dave is helping get started around the world. Uh, Dave teaches computer studies here uh, over at the York campus. And he also helped found something called the Center for the Development of Open Technology. And Dave teaches in a, a kind of a, a funny way, and I think a, a very inspiring way. He doesn't use the classroom to teach. He actually uses Mozilla's global open source community. And his students just get thrown out there with some of the best programmers in the world. And there's actually some of them right here. Um, and just start making real software, which is, I think, how learning should work. And learning is starting to work uh, in this world. And Dave's way of teaching and Dave's software and the software his students are creating have started to, to sow the seeds of something I think the world needs. And what I think the world needs is a global movement, mostly made up of young people, who are focused very much as the scouting movement here was 100 years ago, on skills, on citizenship, and on creativity, on those things and how uh, the plug in to the world of the web, the digital world we live in. And I often ask people when I talk about this, what's the major social innovation? What's the major contribution to society? What's the major thing that didn't exist before scouting? that scouting brought to the world. And people say things like badges or you know, whatever, walking old ladies across the street. The thing that didn't exist before scouting was civilian camping. Only the military camped. You, kinda, you, know, you, you had to be a professional, and you know, there's a lot of big technology to move around. And what Powell wanted to do was connect city kids, connect young people from the cities to nature, help them gain skills that they could use to understand nature, to steward nature. And he used what at the time was an arcane technology only used by professionals camping to do that. Now, if we look 100 years later, how many people here have ever camped? Just put up your hand. Now, keep your hand up if you've ever been a professional camper in the military. So that's a tremendous change in society by just thinking differently about that technology and how it fits into the world. And what I think we need is something similar, a similar aspiration for coding, where 100 years from now, our grandchildren all see coding as something they do for fun and for joy and creativity, and that we have a movement that actually helps us gain the skills, gives us the creativity, and helps us become citizens and stewards of this digital world that we all live in. And so that's the, the, the movement that I think Dave, how he's teaching, and the software he's building, as well as Mozilla and thousands of others around the world are trying to build. So the question is, why would you want to build a movement like that? Well, you know, the, the things, especially if you're here in a kind of community college environment, and I talk at schools all around the world, uh, is the world needs more coders. And these actually are, especially the guy in the accordion, some talented Mozilla coders. Um, and you know, our economy does, and it's partly why colleges exist. But I actually think that is the trivial or the secondary reason that we need a movement like that. I believe that everyone, whether you're in fashion here, whether you're in design, whether you're going into hospitality, whether you want to be a poet, everyone needs to know a little bit of code. Everybody needs to know how the web works. And the reason is that code and the, the digital world really is starting to become the fourth literacy, and a literacy certainly that we all need, but especially that all of our grandchildren will need. That you know, if you think about reading, writing, arithmetic, algorithms, understanding the world is constructed every moment by decisions that we create that then are executed by computers, that is an essential thing that we all need to understand, not just engineers, all of us, and especially all of us 20 years or 50 years or 100 years from now. And it's also something that I think could be an incredible source of, of creativity and joy. So that brings me back to, to Dave for a second. Um, Dave's one of the first people who helped me understand something that a colleague of ours calls view sourcism, which is a kind of a funny term, but I'll, I'll explain it in a second. But I've got to take you back in time. So take you back to 1993, where possibly there are people in the room who weren't even born then. I, but maybe not quite, but you certainly, you know, maybe some people here who weren't using computers. And so you won't remember this thing. Uh, this is Mosaic. It was the first graphical web browser. Uh, and all of what we enjoy now, and certainly all of what Firefox is, uh, comes from Mosaic in some sort of way. And you know that was a great moment uh, for history, I think, but also for the people who were there, because 
you know, computers had pictures. We could move around them, and all of a sudden, things that looked like TVs uh, let us create stuff and move around in them. Uh, and since that time, since 1993, when Mosaic came out, things have gotten better and shinier. The iPad is certainly a, a slicker and cooler and more pleasant to use device uh, and viewing experience than Mosaic ever was. But a couple of other things have changed. A couple of other differences have emerged in that time that are important to understand why a movement like the one I'm talking about is important and why what Dave and his students do is important. And the, the main thing is we've moved from the world that Mosaic created to this, where there's an app store. And the app store, you know, there's two things about it that are, are worth noting. Uh, one is the only people who let you into that app, app store are Apple. You have to ask their permission. And if you want to see how anything you bought in that app store works, you can't. And that's very different than how the web was built and how all of the wealth and creativity that is the internet has been built, which is the principles of the web, and thank God they're still the same principles today, are that anyone can publish anything without permission from anybody else. And that's how we got Facebook, it's how we got Google, it's how we got the Arab Spring. And that is the power of the web, and it's different than what Apple and Google are doing on that device. And the other part of it is, built into the software, built into the design of the web, is that you can view source. You can go and pull down a little menu and see how that website works. And that has been central both to the kind of emancipatory power of the internet and the web, but also to the speed of innovation. Because if you see, say, how's it work, in most cases, although this is changing in, in some regards, you can just go look. And there's nothing that can stop you from looking. So that's what has given us the web that, that you know, we all enjoy today. And the question at this juncture, as we have sort of two visions of the future of the internet, is do we want an internet of consumers? Because I think very much that App Store iPad vision is about elegant consumption. Or do we want to continue to have an internet of creators? And if we talk about that fourth literacy, we talk about our grandchildren, what do we want the internet to look like? And of course, Mozilla and Dave and his students are trying to make sure we continue to have an internet of creators. And specifically, what Mozilla has called out as a goal, uh, and we've put a significant amount of resources behind this, is helping tens of millions of people move from using the web to making the web, to feeling that the web is theirs to control and shape. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do it with people like you and with Seneca. Um, there's you know, a little bit to go back on, which is Firefox certainly uh, is a part of the story. And we, we started Firefox as a project to guard the open nature of the internet, because Microsoft had a monopoly on browsers. A lot of the good things in the internet that I just described in Mosaic were at risk. And so that's what it actually says in our California nonprofit and corporation papers. Mozilla exists to guard the open nature of the internet. And Firefox had an impact on that. We're now working very actively in mobile to build a phone platform and an app platform where the web is the distribution channel where you don't have to ask permission from anybody to get on a phone or on a tablet or in an app store. So that's the other thing we're doing. But the third thing we believe is we need to build that movement. We need to focus on what we call web literacy or that fourth literacy. So in December, Mozilla made a, made a major commitment to web literacy, to building out a set of programs and software to make that vision of a global movement uh, come to life. And so there's three things we're doing, and I'll just touch on them briefly, because I want to get back to the story about Dave and Seneca and how it fits in. But one thing we're doing is building software that teaches people how to use the web as a, by getting them to make cool things. And so one thing we've done is this project called Hackasaurus, a very simple piece of software called the X-ray goggles as a part of it. And I won't explain it. I'll actually let some of my friends from New York explain it. Hey, Yusuf, I found this awesome thing online called Hackasaurus. It's really cool. Hackasaurus, is that a dinosaur? No, it's a project made by Mozilla. Mozilla, are those those people that made Firefox and Thunderbird? Yup. Hackasaurus helps us remix the web. How do you remix the web? Well, you go to hackasaurus.org and install the web x-ray goggles. What do the web x-ray goggles help you see? They help you see what a website's made out of. Then, you can change it to whatever you want. Whatever? Whatever. You, you learn HTML, which is a computer language used to make websites and stuff. Then you can make the website say, 
or show whatever you want. And you can even upload it to the internet. Whoa, Hackasaurus sounds so cool. It is. And the best part is, it's free. Free? Free. Whoa! So, that video you know, tells you two things. One is it shows you a little piece of software we've started. There's about half a dozen pieces of software like that that are about inviting people's creativity, teaching them how the web works, and teaching them the basics of coding for the web all at the same time. And that's a core of what we want to do to contribute to this bigger movement. Um, but the other thing that's great about that video, other than showing that kind of software, is it shows what we believe is central to what we're trying to build, which is community. Those kids made that without us asking. Uh, and that's something you see all the time in Mozilla. Sorry, let me just go back. The second thing we're doing concretely as Mozilla to contribute to growing this movement is building out recipes and badges that make it clear what skills matter. What is that fourth literacy made up of? And so, for example, we've started to work on, or we've prototyped this thing called Love Bomb Builder, lets you create a greeting card uh, you know, for your mom or, or whoever, um, and just kind of walks you through something that's going to teach you a bit of HTML as you go. So simple lessons, but they don't even feel like lessons. Um, and we're also giving people, much like TED does with TEDx, uh, templates for events they can run that are sort of like teach-ins where you can come and learn to create something for the web. So here's an example so of that right now, uh, we did in Tokyo. All of the kids in half, and half of you are going to go to Scratch, and half of you are going to go to Hackasaurus, and then Switch. So this is my, uh, one of my staff, t um, Chris from Brooklyn, uh, clearly dressed up as a Mexican wrestler. Um, doing one of these templated, what we call kind of hive pop-up events, where they're teaching programming to kids in Tokyo. But these events are starting to pop up around the world, very much in the sort of way that, that TEDx is, although it's still early days. So that's the second thing we're doing, is giving people recipes, helping them run events. And then the third thing we're trying to do is find people who want to teach and learn the same things we do. And this summer, we're going to do a campaign where we're going to invite 10,000 kids to teach each other to code and using things like Hackasaurus, but also whatever they pick up. And for us, that bringing together huge numbers of people to teach each other is the central piece of starting or growing this movement. We've already started to see it begin. And the, the difference between that and the Scouts is that, like with something like Product Red, and you can see you know, familiar brands like uh, Coke or Converse or Apple in there, we believe that everybody, and you know, both companies, and nonprofits, individuals, and groups has something to contribute to this movement. It doesn't require becoming, and I think this is one thing that's different than scouting, a part of one big mass. It's about all of us having a shared ethos of the web being something that we control, that we can code, that we can use for our creativity and joy, and having that common ethos unite everybody who cares about that, everyone who wants to build that world. And you know, certainly, and so sorry, just quickly in summary, the three things we're doing are bringing software, recipes, and people together uh, as a part of this. But it does all come back to here and, and people like Dave. And you know, the thing about Dave, as I said, is he, you know, he teaches using this open source method where the students literally don't spend much time in the classroom listening to lectures. They go out, work with expert programmers, people who are like Harvard level quality programmers, and use the fact that open source is made up of peer review as a way to learn. And here's some of the, the students who've been a part of, pop, or a part of uh, Dave's courses um, on the day that they invented something called popcorn. Uh, and that's the other really important part of, of how Dave's teaching, and it's key to this movement, is the courses are about making real software every day that real people will use. And so popcorn, uh, and now something called Popcorn Maker, is a way to make interactive uh, videos. If you think about the fact that this is the YouTube generation. My kids don't watch television, they make and watch YouTube. What we're doing with popcorn is adding another layer that kind of turns up the coolness of YouTube to 11 uh, and lets kids or anybody bring in data, uh, bring in layered imagery, bring in Twitter, bring in Google Maps as a part of the videos that they're making or layered inside of the videos they're making. And so this is a very early prototype of the popcorn maker piece where what you can see is uh, this lets you create a VH1 pop-up video type of experience on any video on the web uh, very quickly, but do, does it in a sort of iMovie-like way. So what we're doing and what Dave's students are doing is simple, consumer-grade software that anyone can use to make something cool, but that also 
as in this case, and you can see the HTML code coming up on the screen, exposes you to and teaches you the code that makes up the web. And so the, the things that are being seeded out of Dave's way of teaching and the things that that software is bringing to the world are the seeds of 10,000 kids coding this summer using things like popcorn and are the seeds of that movement. And you know what really is important in terms of this TEDx Seneca event is those seeds are incredibly important. They've inspired and shaped me in how I think Mozilla should work in this space. They've provided very real software that I would say 60, 80 percent of that popcorn software that I just showed you comes from here at Seneca, at least the roots of it or the kind of core code behind it. And so, you know, there's lots of other places I take inspiration from, but this is absolutely one of them, and it is absolutely a, a core contribution to what we're trying to build in the world. And what it takes is lots of those contributions from around the world, and all of them are important. But it's important to know that what's happening here isn't, you know, just Mozilla coming and, you know, teaching a little bit of stuff. It's founding and feeding into something incredibly important. And that's what I wanted to leave you all with, which is you all have something incredible to contribute to your grandchildren and to building that movement if you care about the digital society remaining something that's open, something that's about creativity, and something where you don't have to ask permission if you have an idea for a business or a piece of art or a new design. You all have an incredible role to play in that, and this is incredibly fertile ground for that. So whether you're in, as I said before, fashion or you want to become a, a poet, there's something for you in teaching and understanding how the web works, how code will shape our lives, and understanding that it's not engineers that should control that future, but all of us. And so all of us have something to, to contribute to that, and all of us in small ways can certainly build this movement that I believe the world needs if we want the digital world to be as inspiring and alive as the natural world is today. And it's something I think all of us should care about. Thanks very much.